The first known female playwright in history was Ratzvita of Grandersheim, who was writing just about the year 1000, just a little before that. She was the first person of either gender known to write drama in the classical style after the fall of Rome, after the great classical period. And she's very interesting to us for a large number of reasons, including that she is just recently becoming widely known again, and the real virtues of her work are just now becoming widely known again. Ratzvita's name has been a source of great controversy, but she herself said that it was an old Saxon word meaning strong voice. One of the reasons that scholarship about her is a little difficult is because her name, the spelling of her name, is not standardized. You can see here a list of five other ways to spell that name, sometimes starting with an H, sometimes starting with an R, uh, sometimes with a W, and sometimes with the V making the V sound in the middle of it, uh, and with a variety of endings. Because it is spelled so many ways, when you go off to do a little scholarship about her, you often have to search with multiple spellings in order to find everything available. We have, as with many of the classical playwrights, less biographical information about Ross Vita than we would like to have. Um, she was certainly very prolific as a writer herself and put a lot of biographical details into her writing. So we can figure out a number of things just from what she said about herself, but we actually have no direct evidence of her birth date, of the date in which she was consecrated as a, a secular canonist, or her death. Uh, her writing implies that she was born to a noble family in the area of Saxony, northern Germany, um, and we can generally figure out her, the period of her life just from references she makes to contemporaries. It's thought that she was born about 935 of the Common Era and lived until just after the first millennium. She is thought to have been a secular canonist, that is, a woman who lived in a convent, but she was not formally a nun, so she was probably not completely cloistered. She could come and go from the convent, and she interacted with a number of notable men in her time, uh, which was unusual for, for women. She studied with the abbess Gerberga, uh, who was the daughter and the sister of a king. So she was a very well-educated woman herself, a very privileged woman herself, uh, and a number of those uh, privileges seem to have been extended to Ratzvita also, who may have been a relative of some sort. We just don't know absolutely. Uh, Ratzvita was famous in her own time as a very learned woman, as a writer of books, uh, she allegedly presented her books to the Emperor Otto. Uh, she's shown doing so here in a woodcut by uh, Durer, uh, Albrecht Durer, uh, made in about the year 1500, when she was just being rediscovered. Her works are Latin comedies, uh, closely modeled on the pattern of Terence. Comedy as a genre is, is a word that doesn't necessarily mean funny, it just means not tragic. So only one of her plays is a comedy in the contemporary sense of something intended to provoke laughter. Her work is also uh, controversial, though a lot of the controversy is just quite simply that in her own time and even up to modern times, there's a fairly large number of people who refuse to believe she could have written it because they think women could never have had the education to do so, or simply that women are incapable of writing great, great uh, literature. Um, both of those are kind of ridiculous viewpoints. We know so much about Ratzvita to know that the work really is hers. 
She wrote six comedies, and those six comedies may have been intended specifically to replace Terence, on whom they are modeled, uh, in the teaching of Latin at the convent. Starting in the 1800s or so, uh, scholars begin to suggest that she wrote these plays because Terence's plays had too much sex in them. In the 21st century, though, feminist scholars think that she might have thought Terence's plays had too much sexism in them, particularly the way that his plays often feature rape plots and the way he seems rather casual about uh, rape uh, as an, uh, an element in his plots. It often ends happily by the young women marrying their rapists. So it's not quite sure why they would find that a happy ending, but it was a typical uh, feeling in his time. It may well have been that Rod Svita, however, as a woman, saw right through that particular uh, formulation. Her six plays uh, include uh, probably the best-known one, Gallicanus, uh, which is about the pagan warrior Gallicanus, who wants to marry the Emperor Constantine's Christian daughter, Constance. But Constance, as her name would apply, about Constancy, wants to remain a virgin, uh, wants to dedicate her life to Christ. Um, this is in the period before, it's set in the period before the establishment of the church as we now know it. So she's not really wanting to be a nun, she's just wanting to remain virginal. Um, Constance recognizes that the marriage to Gallicanus would be an honorable one, she's just not interested in it, but she arranges for Gallicanus to learn more about her religion, and on the eve of a battle, when it looks like he might be defeated, he pledges that he will convert to Christianity if he is granted a victory, which he is, and he follows through on his pledge and does convert. But upon conversion, again, this is the early church, he himself takes a vow of chastity and informs the Emperor, Gallic, uh, the Emperor Constantine that he's no longer available to marry uh, Constance. And as it happens, that's an ending that is supposed to make both of them very happy. Uh, and you can kind of figure out why a, a secular nun, a secular canonist, might find that a happy ending. Dulcitius is the comedy that is the one of, uh, of Ross Vita's six works that we would sort of think of in a contemporary sense as meant to provoke laughter. It's actually a bit farcial. Um, it's, a, it's an odd play about this man, Dulcitius, uh, who's appointed to guard three Christian women who are on trial and uh, who are supposed to renounce their religion. Um, he volunteers for the job because they're all young and pretty and he thinks they look great uh, and his intention is to sneak into the prison and rape them but when he actually does sneak into the the place where they're being held uh, he under he's he's m mentally stricken it's implied that this is some kind of heavenly intervention but it is never directly stated uh, but anyway uh, he, instead of sneaking into their rooms, sneaks into the kitchen where he mistakenly believes that he is near the young women, uh, and rather than raping them, he ends up um, molesting the pots and pans in the kitchen. He's covered with uh, dirt and soot and grime. His contemporaries uh, make fun of him. He becomes furious and orders that the three young women uh, be uh, stripped and burnt, uh, but when the soldiers come to take their clothes off, they are miraculously prevented from being able to do so. Uh, looks to me like the person who made this particular woodcut or this particular engraving um, may have moved a little further than the plot actually goes, but that way he gets to engrave nudes. Uh, as it turns out in this play, it all works out well for the maidens. They are miraculously saved, and Dulcicius is uh, uh, becomes an object of ridicule, uh, and is sorry that he ever got involved with them in the first place. 
Callimachus is another conversion drama featuring a pagan man who converts because of a virtuous and chaste young woman. Uh, in this case, the young woman actually dies, uh, and he actually dies, and both of them are resurrected, and then he converts uh, in the afterlife because uh, of his uh, experience. Um, Abraham is the play that we would find the most surprising of Rosvita's plays uh, because of its directness about sex. It features a young woman named Mary who is uh, related to the monastery in some way, the abbey in some way, uh, but leaves the religious life and turns to a life of prostitution. Her uncle Abraham, who is an older wise man, uh, decides to intervene and he actually dresses up as a young man uh, and then goes to the house of prostitution uh, al allegedly to buy her services uh, or to woo her. Um, but when he gets there and gets her attention, he actually uses his time to preach to her until she repents. She sees the error of her ways, and because of his dedication, she comes back into the fold of the church. Paphnutius is really the story of Thais, a courtesan uh, in ancient Alexandria, who becomes very wealthy from her uh, services as prostitute, as courtesan. And she is very much in love with money and with worldly goods. But Paphnutius, who's an aesthetic, uh, converts her to Christianity. What is striking in this play, however, is that Paphnutius does not order her to convert or shame her into converting. He merely explains to her that her love of money and worldly goods is, uh, is sinful. And as soon as she hears this news, she really thinks it through and realizes that she has been in denial and that in fact it is sinful. That is, she is treated as perfectly intelligent and as Paphnutius' uh, equal, and her conversion is not because she is under the influence of men, but merely because she decides it's the right thing to do. Sapientia is the most surprising of all of Ross Vita's plays. It's a very simple story that the Emperor Hadrian uh, attempts to force three women to renounce their Christianity, uh, but their mother urges them to stay firm and promises them that if they uh, will hold firm, they'll be martyred, but they'll make it into heaven, and indeed that's what happens. They, they hold firm to their uh, convictions, and they are tortured to death in the course of the play, and they are martyred. But the tone of the play is not at all celebratory. It is not a, a fundamentalist message about the glories of martyrdom. The play actually seems to question the mother's motives uh, and suggest that martyrdom is not all that attractive and that that kind of fanaticism may not be absolutely necessary, that the young woman could have uh, prevaricated uh, and that heaven would be perfectly understanding had they done so, and that they might have uh, both lived Christian lives and gone on to live happily. Uh, that is, it, it's not really a play in the spirit of the early church. It's a play that is uh, more modern in many ways about the church that is maturing. Ross Vitas seemed to have been a very well-known woman in her time, and a very intellectual woman in her time, and she was clearly aware of classical drama, uh, classical literature, of both uh, Greek literature. She wrote uh, some prose works in the form of the Iliad and the Odyssey, and then Latin plays in the form of Terence. 
but she was not tremendously uh, influential in her own time. Uh, she was writing right at what we would think of as, as the, the, the beginning, the end of the Dark Ages and the beginning of the Middle Ages, but church drama did not follow this pattern, and at her death her works became unknown again until they were rediscovered in the 1500s and brought uh, to the attention of the public and then maybe became more influential with Renaissance writers and became much more interesting in modern times when it was realized that she was the first nameable uh, female playwright. This work therefore is not part of the long co continuity of Western drama as much as it is a work that is interesting because it tells us about missed opportunities, about the intellectual power of women and the way in which historically uh, Western civilization may have failed to build on the accomplishments of women and how tragic that might be, but how lucky we are to have recovered the work in the end.